get started here. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce our, our basic science speaker this morning, Vladimir Kefalov. Uh, I met Vladimir just a little over a year ago when I was a guest speaker out at Washington University in St. Louis, where he, where he was. And I found out that, uh, although I was familiar with some of his work in published literature, um, you know, we shared an awful lot of things in common, uh, particularly with an interest in the visual cycle and biochemistry of vision, and which he will be talking about this morning. He also will be giving a second talk uh, later today to the uh, basic science, uh, for the basic science faculty when more of them are awake. And we will, and that will be at noon here, so, and that will be on a different subject than calcium in the eye. And so, I hope that, that many of you can be able to make it to that, to that talk also. Um, just in terms of a background, Vladimir is from Bulgaria. Uh, he, did, he is into motorcycling and actually, believe it or not, he did drive here from St. Louis over the last three days on a motorcycle through a rainstorm in, or a rain and snowstorm in Wyoming just to be here. And he still has a multiple day trip a journey back. He's going to take a more southern route, which hopefully will be a little more temperate on the way back. Um, he went, he did his uh, undergraduate and master's degree in Bulgaria between 1988 and 1993, and he was, a phys he was into physics, hardcore phys solid state physics at the time, and then came here to the U.S. and worked in Carter Cornwall's uh, laboratory at Boston University, and got his PhD there, uh, moving into the physiology and early events of visual pigment regeneration. And then he did a postdoctoral fellowship at King Wai Yao at Johns Hopkins, working on <coughs> the functional differences between retinal rod and photoreceptors. He's been at WashU for a little over 10 years now, and has moved up to the ranks very rapidly, and now is a full professor. So I think I will let him go from there. Okay. Thank you, Paul, for the invitation and uh, for the kind introduction. I'm really excited to be here. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm still on central time, so it's uh, 7 a.m. for me, and like Paul said, I'm a basic scientist, so I'm usually up at this time of the day, but uh, my brain is still a little slow. So um, this is a new presentation for me. I haven't given this talk before. The same goes for the noon talk. If I say something that doesn't make sense to you, or, or, or uh, maybe uh, you have questions, feel free to stop me and ask me anything. So um, as Paul said, my lab is interested in the physiology of photoreceptors. And I thought I'll tell you a story today, which uh, essentially the punchline is that we believe that some of the studies that we have been doing have a very uh, fundamental clinical relevance. And uh, the story that I hope you remember from this whole presentation is that the Mueller glial cells actually play a very important role in mediating the function and more importantly, the survival of COM photoreceptors, and of course, those are the cells that mediate our daytime vision, and without them, again, I'm sure you all know, uh, we are legally blind and cannot function well. So um, uh, before I start into in the dive into the science, I just want to give credit. Uh, this work is mostly uh, done by a couple of uh, people from my lab. I have a small lab, uh, Jin Shan Wang and Yun Lu, who is uh, now a student in Connie Sepko's lab at Harvard, and some of the work was actually also done by Sasha Kolesnikov. I'll show some collaborative results with Joe Corbo's lab, who is also at Washington University. And uh, towards the end, I'll show you some really neat gene therapy studies, uh, which were done in collaboration with John Finery's lab, who makes these uh, just amazing AAV viruses that can drive expression in photoreceptors. And we've been uh, helped with uh, colleagues with reagents and mice. And of course, we've been fortunate enough to still stay afloat with, despite uh, how difficult and even more difficult funding in science becomes. And I have no conflicts of interest for what it's worth. All right, so uh, you all know this picture, of course. You know that uh, the retina is in the back of the eye and light travels through all the layers in the retina and eventually it is detected by rod and cone photoreceptors. And the purposes, for the purposes of this presentation, uh, you should uh, uh, be aware that, of course, the photoreceptors are not functioning in vacuum they are actually surrounded by two separate layers of uh, supporting or helping cells. Uh, behind the, the photoreceptors is the monolayer of retinal pigment epithelial cells, and their processes span between the photoreceptors, and of course the RPE cells play a critical role in supporting the function of photoreceptors by providing them with nutrients, by removing the, the shedded uh, outer segment discs, uh, 
and of course by also providing chromophore, which is vital for the function of photoreceptors. But in addition to that, on the other side uh, of the photoreceptors, there is another supporting or helper cell, which is usually ignored, and that's the Mueller glial cells. So the Mueller glial cells actually span the whole retina. They're like rubber bands that essentially keep the whole retina together, and they have processes that kind of also wrap around the cell bodies of photoreceptors. And as I'll tell you today, they actually play a very important role in supporting the function specifically of calm photoreceptors. <coughs> So, of course, we have two photoreceptor types, and they have very similar structure, but they mediate very different kind of visual experience. And I like to use this slide to kind of remind everybody how different rod and cone uh, mediated vision is. So rods, of course, we use in dim light. They are extremely sensitive. They can detect even a single photon of light. Uh, but this high sensitivity comes at a, at a high price as well. So rod responses are relatively slow. Uh, in addition, our visual system integrates the signal from hundreds and thousands of rod photoreceptors into a single ganglion cell that goes then to the brain. And as a result, the spatial resolution of our rod mediated to dim light vision is relatively low. And that's why in dim light, the images that we see are kind of blurry. And of course, because we only have one type of rod photoreceptor, we're not able to detect light uh, colors, to, to discriminate colors. And again, this, this is why in dim light, Everything looks kind of grayish, greenish. You cannot see uh, red and green uh, and blue colors. In addition, rods saturate even in moderately bright light. So as soon as the sun comes out, actually, your rods become saturated, and they no longer contribute to your visual experience. And finally, I'm sure all of you have experienced this. Your rods actually are very slow to dark adapt or to reset their high sensitivity after exposure to bright light. And the example that I like to give is if you are going to the movies and you're late and you walk into the movie theater after the movie has already started and it's dark in the room and all of a sudden you're blind. You don't see anything so you kind of stumble around and you find a place to sit. And if you look around half an hour later you can actually see pretty well. And the reason it takes so long be before you can see is because your rods, which are the cells that you need for dim light vision, take about 30 to 40 minutes to fully reset their sensitivity. They're extremely slow. And so, uh, again, this is what happens in dim light. And of course, the situation in bright light is very different. This is when your cone photoreceptors take over. And because you have three types of cones, red, green, and blue, you can discriminate colors. And in addition, cones have very fast responses, which mediates very rapid, uh, very good temporal resolution of your cone mediated vision. And this is one of the topics that I will talk about at noon, if you get a chance to stop by. Uh, and critical for the function of cones as our daytime photoreceptors is their ability to remain functional and, and adapt even in very bright light. So even if you're out in, in beautiful Utah skiing in the winter and there are billions of photons hitting your photoreceptors, your cones are still somehow able to adjust their sensitivity and remain uh, able to respond to light. And finally, cones dark it up very quickly, so there is no refractory period as in you, with your rods. And you, you, if you go from bright to dimmer environment, but still bright enough uh, for your cones to detect light, again, there is no period where you're blinded. And so my lab has been really focused on understanding these particular properties of cone photoreceptors, their ability to function in bright light, and also their ability to dark it up very, very rapidly. And uh, one of the features that we have been uh, focusing on is the visual pigment and what happens with the visual pigment in cones after it is photoactivated. And it turns out that what happens in cones is very different from what happens with rods, and it helps to a large degree explain this functional difference between rods and cones. So let me tell you what I mean by the visual cycle. So in both rods and cones, detection of light happens in the outer segment of photoreceptors, which again are kind of embedded in the RPE cells. And detection happens when a photon of light is absorbed by the visual chromophore, which is 11 cis retina. And uh, it, this chromophore is bound covalently to, uh, to opsin. This is a G-protein coupled receptor. And the two together form the visual pigment. And the outer segments contain stacks of lipid disks, which are packed with so much visual pigment that a photon of light traveling along the outer segment has about a 50% chance of being detected and activate a visual pigment molecule. And when this uh, pigment is activated by light, it triggers a whole transduction cascade, which ultimately results in generation of the light response. But then 
Consequently, this pigment needs to be recycled or reset. It's just like a, a light switch. If you turn it on, you have to turn it off again before you can turn the light on again. And so uh, this happens through a fairly complex set of reactions called the visual cycle. So first what happens is that uh, the cis retina, which uh, light, when light absorbs it, is, is switched to all trans retina. And this is the molecular switch that activates the pigment comes out, so there's the covalent bond between opsin and retinal, which is broken, and uh, opsin is left behind, and then all trans retinal is reduced to all trans retinol, which then is actually uh, exported through the, from the photoreceptor into the RPE cell, and there, through a set of enzymatic reactions, is recycled back into 11 cis retinal. And then in this 11 cis retinal comes back into the photoreceptor finds a free opsin molecule, binds covalently, and the pigment is regenerated again. And so there is, as you hopefully can appreciate, there is a fairly involved process in resetting the visual pigment. And the reason why rods take about 40 minutes to dark adapt is because it takes about 40 minutes for their chromophore, which was destroyed essentially by the light, to be recycled by the RPE cells and to, for the pigment to regenerate. And this same process happens also in COM photoreceptors. And for the last 100 years, the dogma has been that uh, the RPE cells are, is the only location for recycling of chromophore and the only source for chromophore for both rods and cons are the RPE cells. However, if you think about it, if it takes the rods 40 minutes before the RPE cells can provide them with chromophore, then how come the cons can dark adapt not in 40 minutes but in two minutes? So something smelled fishy, something it looks like it's not right. And if you look through the literature over the last maybe 40, 50 years, you can see bits and, bits and pieces here and there of evidence that cons might use a separate visual cycle that is independent of the RPE and provides chromophore only to them and not to the rods. And the idea was, again, based on biochemistry from multiple groups, is that actually the Mueller glial cells in the neural retina itself might also play a role in recycling chromophore and taking all trans retinol, the spent chromophore from photoreceptors, and then simply converting it back to 11 cis retinol, which will then uh, come back into photoreceptors, be oxidized to 11 cis retinol, and used for regeneration of pigment. And so this was all kind of the, the state of knowledge. And this, this uh, pathway had been shown to, uh, again, there were biochemical reactions, mostly them from condominant species like chicken and ground squirrel suggesting that the mule cells might be able to do that, but there is really no uh, physiological evidence, no functional evidence that this pathway actually exists, and it wasn't known whether it functions in rod dominant species such as humans or, or mice, and it was not known what, if any, the functional role of this pathway is. And so this is at the time when I was setting up my lab, and I thought that it looked like an interesting question to tackle, and uh, kind of the proof of principle, the basic, um, uh, experiment that we did is uh, conceptually extremely simple, almost embarrassingly simple, and it's amazing that people didn't try it before us, or maybe people thought it was too easy to work, or maybe somebody tried it and didn't believe the results. And so the basic idea is that if there is a pathway that allows you to uh, regenerate pigment only in cons that does not involve the RP cells and instead involves the Mueller cells, then all you need to do is basically dissect the retina out from the pigment epithelium, so get rid of the RP and then expose this retina to bright light that will bleach the pigment and convert it to opsin and destroy the, the, the pigment in both rods and cones, and then simply put this retina in darkness for an hour or two, and then go back and examine the state of, of adaptation or the, the amount of pigment and ask, will the pigment come back or not? And so if there is another pathway that involves the Mueller cells, the cones should dark it up, they should, they should regenerate their pigment, and regain their sensitivity. But if the RPE is the only mechanism for providing chromophore, we should see no recovery once we get rid of the RPE. Everybody still with me so far? Okay, all right. So uh, how do we study this physiologically? So um, it turns out that the sensitivity of photoreceptors is directly correlated with the amount of pigment that they have. And this kind of makes sense. Is the more pigment you have in the outer segment, the more likely a photon is to be detected and to, to generate a light response. So what we can do is we can indirectly measure the state of adaptation or the, st or the state of, of the visual in, in the visual cycle 
by simply measuring the sensitivity of the photoreceptor. So if we place the animal or, or a subject in darkness for a long time and we allow all the pigment to regenerate in both rods and cones, they, are achieve, they will achieve their highest maximum sensitivity. On the other hand, if we bleach the pigment and prevent it from regenerating, then the cell should be highly desensitized by orders of magnitude. So again, we can use physiological measurements to detect the sensitivity from there deduce what state uh, of the visual pigment we are looking into. So how do we study this? Um, we do this mostly in mice. We've done some of those experiments actually also in primate and even human retina and what I'm going to tell you holds there as well. So uh, the basic um, approach is again pretty straightforward. Um, turns out that photoreceptors are polar cells. They're essentially like a double A battery. You can think of them as the outer segment as, as the plus sign and the inner segment is the minus sign, and that's probably the closest I can get to, to a double A battery. But so what happens is that current actually flows into the outer segment of the cell in darkness, and then the current leaves through the other end of the cell. So essentially there's current that flows along the photoreceptor in darkness. And when you shine light, this current is reduced or fully blocked. And so what we can do is we can uh, make a glass electrode that has just the right diameter so that we can draw the cell inside like that. And so now the, inner, the outer segment of the cell will be inside our recording electrode. And the current that flows through the cell will also flow through our suction electrode. And then when we stimulate the cell with light and the current changes, we can actually record the changes in this current. And the beauty of this technique is that you don't have to break into the cell to measure the current that flows through. And as a result, the cell actually lasts a long time. So when we do, for instance, recordings with amphibian photoreceptors, we can fully dissociate the cells. We can take a dissociated uh, rod or cone photoreceptor, completely detached from the retina, get it, get it in our recording electrode, and record from the same cell and keep it alive for five, six hours. So again, it, you can do a lot of experiments on a single cell. And so this is demonstrated here, and it's kind of hard to see, I know, but this is an infrared image uh, from a piece of mouse retina. And you can see the outer segments, mostly broad outer segments sticking out. And you may or may not be able to see, but you have to trust me on this, is that there is one broad outer segment that was drawn in our uh, glass electrode. And so again, when we do this, and when we stimulate this cell with light, we can record uh, the changes in the current, transient changes when we give a flash, brief flash at time zero. And of course, the brighter the flash, the bigger the response until eventually the responses saturate. And so using this method, we can measure the responses from single rod photoreceptors. And if we take now the peak of each of those responses and plot it as a function of the light intensity of the flash that was used to generate it, we can get an intensity response curve or a dose response curve for this particular rod. And again, because this is a mouse rod, this is a highly uh, sensitive, dark adapted cell, you can see that the cell starts to respond to as few as maybe one to two photons per micron square. So extremely sensitive, detecting single photons of light. Okay, so this is kind of the baseline. So now we can compare this cell with a rod that was taken from a retina that was removed from the RPE and then bleached and then kept in darkness for a few hours. So no, no longer RPE around, so no, no way to regenerate the pigment. And when we look from a rod from a retina like this, we find that the responses now are significantly smaller and a response that before gave us a maximum, response, uh, maximum amplitude, this is the red trace, the same flash now barely gives a threshold response at all. Again, you see there's a little red, uh, red trace here. And if we do the intensity response curve for this cell, again, you see that there's maybe a hundredfold or more than a uh, hundredfold decrease in the sensitivity. You need a hundred times more light to get a response compared to the dark adapted. So, no surprise there, the rod, once you bleach its pigment, stays permanently desensitized even four hours after the bleach. So the RP is really critical for the regeneration of rod pigment. Okay, so what about the cones? So we can do the exact same experiment in cones, and this is shown here. Again, those are dark adapted responses from a, from a mouse cone, and you can get the intensity response curve, and now you need more light, of course, because that's a cone, it needs, uh, it's less sensitive. But compare this to a cone that was taken from a retina without RPE, bleached, and then allowed to dark it up for two hours. And the first thing you notice is that the responses actually come back. The amplitude is all the way back. And if you look at the intensity response curve, maybe there is a two, three-fold reduction in sensitivity, but there is nowhere near the decrease in sensitivity that we saw in the rod. Uh, 
And because this experiment was done without any RPA around, the only way you can explain the recovery of sensitivity of this cone is that somehow it was able to regenerate a substantial amount of its pigment without any help from the pigment epithelium. And as a way of understanding how this is uh, happening and taking place, as the next experiment, we actually pulled the cone from the retina and then we gave the bleach. And in this case, as you can see, the cone was no longer able to dark it up and now there is the, the, the situation looks much like what we saw in the rods. And so together what this shows is that the cones can dark it up in the retina with the help of cells. They cannot do this autonomously, but they rely on contact with other retinal cells. And eventually we were able to show using pharmacology that the mullous cell, glial cells play a critical role and they are the location where the chromophore is recycled and provides the dark adaptation in comfort receptors. Everybody still with me? Okay. All right, so the kind of the emerging picture then is that whereas rods rely only on their RPE for uh, sort of as a source of chromophore, cones can actually draw chromophore from two separate places. One is kind of the canonical RPE visual cycle, and the other is this novel uh, neural retina visual cycle where the Mueller cells provide the chromophore. And uh, through a set of experiments we have been able to show, and uh, most of those are published now, that this pathway actually is what provides the initial rapid component of cone dark adaptation and then the RPE's uh, visual cycle comes in later to complete this last two, three fold of sensitivity that the cones did not recover. So uh, one question or one issue that we haven't been, had not been able to resolve until recently is to find a way to genetically manipulate this pathway. And the reason we wanted to do this was to understand what is the relative significance of this pathway versus this pathway in mediating the function of cones and also the long-term survival of cone photoreceptors. And so we started looking around and trying to figure out again a way to, to, to tease apart the two visual cycles and understand the relative contribution of the RPE versus the Mueller cells in mediating the rapid regeneration and dark adaptation of cones and also their long-term health. And when we were doing this, we realized that we might be able to do this um, when we found that um, one particular protein called CRLBP, which stands for cellular retin aldehyde binding protein, is expressed in both the RPE cells and in the Mueller cells. So CRLBP is a chromophore binding protein and it binds specifically to 11 cis retinoids. And so it's believed in both the RPE cells and in the Mueller cells that a CRLBP speeds up the recycling of chromophore by binding to the product, to the 11 cis product of the re-isomerization reaction and by a simple mass action law accelerating the turnover of chromophore in both RPE cells and in Mueller cells. Uh, Patient, there are mutations in CRLBP that have been associated with uh, a whole range of visual disorders in, in people, in humans, uh, and also mice uh, where CRLBP have been, has been knocked out has abnormally slow rot dark adaptation. Again, consistent with the, with the notion that CRLBP essentially speeds up the recycling of chromophore in the RPE. So we wanted to know whether we can actually tackle the question what is CRLBP doing in the Mueller cells and indirectly from there maybe get a, a, a genetic or molecular handle on manipulating individually each of those visual cycles as a way of understanding its, its functional significance. And so uh, to do this we, uh, we uh, applied two separate recording techniques because we wanted to record the recovery of cones in real time. Uh, so again I'm sure all of you are familiar with in vivo ERGs where you basically place an electrode on the cornea and then a reference electrode somewhere else on the body. And this allows you to record the voltage changes across the retina when the retina is stimulated with light. And you get this kind of prototypic um, ERG response consisting of a downward A wave, which is generated by rod photoreceptors. And it's just the initial rising component of the photoreceptor response actually, which is very quickly masked by uh, an upward B wave which is generated by bipolar cells. And, and so using this, again, people, um, this, this is widely used in the clinic, I'm sure by some of you, but also it's a very useful uh, research tool uh, in, in animals, animal studies and you can do ERGs for mice and it's a very informative technique. Uh, this technique, however, has limitations, especially when you want to study cone function, photopic ERGs, 
because the, the amount, the fraction of cons in, in human retinas or mice retinas is very small, 3% to 5%. And so the photopic A wave generated by cone photoreceptors is usually minuscule, very, very hard to see. And so typically, you know, uh, any uh, photopic study that you will see is actually looking at the photopic or cone-driven B wave because the B wave is much larger. And so the B wave is a wonderful tool, but it's, a, it's an indirect measure of the function of cone photoreceptors because you're looking at the cell downstream from the cone, not at the cone itself. And so to go around that, we've, we've been using uh, another technique, kind of a, a variation of this, which is ex vivo ERG. So it's the same principle, but now you dissect the retina. Again, obviously you cannot do this with humans, but with animals, you can take the retina out and have an electrode on each side, and then again you measure the voltage across. But the advantage that you gain by doing this ex vivo is that you can use synaptic blockers to prevent the signal from traveling beyond the photoreceptors. And so, whereas in vivo you'll get the A wave and then the B wave, ex vivo you can essentially block the B wave. And what you will get then will be the A wave, but the, the the B wave will no longer mask most of the response from cones, and so you'll get actually a beautiful response that will look like this, which will be generated by the cones. And you can study then the kinetics of this response, the amplitude, and, and all that, the sensitivity. And so we've used the combination of those two methods to study the role of CRI ALBP in the function of cones. And this is an example of what we did in vivo. So this, those are in vivo ERGs from, uh, Wild-type mice, uh, mice that are deficient in CRLBP, and that's just the gene name of, of the protein, and heterozygous mice. And again, you see that the A wave, which is the, the, the downward inflection in the response, is relatively small, but you can see a substantial B wave, the upward wave. And if you compare, if you plot the, the amplitude of the B wave as a function of the flash intensity, again, you find that the wild-type and heterozygous mice have normal uh, ERG responses, cone-driven ERG responses, but the knockouts have severely desensitized cones and also their maximum response amplitude is substantially reduced. And so is this coming from the cones or is this coming from the bipolar cells? Because again, the readout here is bipolar cells. <coughs> and so to go uh, into uh, addressing this question, then we did the ex vivo ERGs, and you see how you, know, you can get beautiful responses. Now those are driven from the cons, again, if, if you think about that, this is the A wave inflection that we see here, but if we, knock, if we block the B wave pharmacologically, then you'll get the full response that will look like this. And that's what I'm showing you here. And those are the controls cons, and those are the knockout cons. And so again, in the absence of CRLBP, cons sensitivity is severely reduced, the cons require more light to be activated, and their maximum response is also substantially reduced. So, so why is that? Are the cones fewer? Are they sick? Uh, why is their response lower and why are they less sensitive? So to, to, ask this, to address this question, we looked at the morphology of retinas. And the first thing we noticed that was that uh, cone pigment was mislocalized in our knockouts. So that whereas in wild type cones, opsin, cone opsin is localized exclusively in the cone outer segments, in the absence of CRLBP, conopsin was all over the cell. And uh, this is consistent with an idea that Rosalie Crouch has proposed maybe 10 years ago, namely that conopsin requires chromophore as a chaperone to be folded properly and to be targeted to the outer segment. And when we take out this protein CRLBP, we are essentially depriving the retina from chromophore and as a result, conopsin is mislocalized. We also noticed that there was degeneration, so the number of cones gradually declined in, uh, with age in our knockouts. So it looks like, again, the, taking out serial BP had both functional and, and morphological changes in cone photoreceptors. So what about dark adaptation? Ultimately, again, we're interested in how this protein and how the two visual cycles affect dark adaptation of cones. So again, we did this both in vivo, where we can look at the dark adaptation of cones in the context of the intact system, where both the RP cells and the Mueller cells are still there and providing chromophore. And this is shown here. So the basic experiment is you take an, an anesthetized mouse and you measure the sensitivity with a dim flash first in, in its highly dark adapted state. And so that will be when the cones will be the most sensitive. 
and then you expose the eyes, the retina, to very bright light for a minute or two that is designed to bleach over 90% of the pigment in the photoreceptors. And then you put the animal back in darkness and you follow how the cone sensitivity is coming back after this bleach. And this is shown here. Again, the sensitivity initially goes down more than 15 fold. And then with time, as the pigment in cones is regenerating, their sensitivity is coming back. And I should point out that uh, because those are anesthetized animals, the kinetics of this sensitivity is somewhat slower than that it happens normally. If you do this in an awake animal or in humans, again, the cone sensitivity is back within five minutes. So again, you see how, how the time course of cone dark adaptation in, in the normal condition. What happens when we take out this CRLBP protein? Well, if, what you find is that this dark adaptation of cones is largely suppressed. And that's really a, a striking result for me because that's the first animal model ever that I've seen where cones are unable to dark it out quickly. You can do so many things to cones and they always bounce back immediately. It's, it's almost annoying because if you want to study that dark adaptation, it's so quick, it's difficult to measure. But in this case, again, dark adaptation was highly suppressed in the, in the cones for mice lacking CRLBP. So how much of this is because the Mueller cells are not providing chromophore and how much is because the RP cells are not functioning well? Well, we can see that the late phase is compromised, and we know that the rods dark adapt slower. So we know that the RPE cells are slower. But uh, in order to look at the Mueller cells, we can do the same experiment, but now in the isolated <coughs> retina, where the only way chromophore is getting to the cones is from the Mueller cells. And so this is the example in the control. So now, again, this is an isolated retina, no RPE. And you see that, again, right after the bleach, sensitivity goes way down. Initially, this, there is this initial uh, recovery is actually the response, the, the, the cell turning off from the, from the light, from the bleaching light. And then there is this late recovery of sensitivity, which is driven by the Mueller cells. And if we kill the Mueller cells, essentially, we will get the recovery up to here. So what happens when we take out CRLBP? It's exactly the same thing. So this recovery driven by the Mueller cells now is largely suppressed. And so what this result clearly shows is that the Mueller cells require CRLBP to drive this recovery of cone sensitivity. Still with me? OK, all right. So, uh, so that's great. So, we can, so based on this, we know that CRLBP in the Mueller cells actually plays a functional role because we can see how, when we take it out, we suppress the recovery of cones. But we still haven't answered the, the major question, which is how can we discriminate between the role of RP cells versus the Mueller cells? So one way we, we, we could do this is to now restore the function of either the RP cells or the Mueller cells by genetically or by using a gene therapy approach to drive expression of CRLBP in one of those two tissues. And so the idea is, again, to take a CRLBP knockout mouse and use an AAV injection as a, as a way of gene therapy, basically rescue one or the other cell type, either the RP cell or the Mueller cell, and then ask which one will give us more beneficial effect for the function of cones. <clears throat> and so this is um, uh, just a wild type retina showing the expression of CRLBP. And again, it's present and abundantly expressed in RP cells. And it's also abundantly expressed in the Mueller cells that span the whole retina. And of course, in the knockout, all of this expression is gone. And so we, again, we worked with John Flannery, and they made this really neat virus, which allowed us to reintroduce CRLBP selectively in the RP cells by injecting the virus intravitreally. And the beauty of in, an intravitreal injection, as opposed to subretinal injection, is that the, the virus can basically penetrate and give you uniform expression throughout the whole eye. And again, you see now that the RP layer in the whole eye expresses CRLBP, and this is also shown in a retinal section. So now we have normal RP visual cycle that expresses CRLBP, but the Mueller cells still lack this protein. So how, how will that affect the function of cones or not? Will that rescue cones or not? And so what we found was that there was really no rescue at all. So this is, of course, the isolated retina recovery, which since we haven't rescued expression in immune cells, we didn't expect any change. So we're comparing uh, injection of GFP control versus injection of CRLBP driven only in the RP. But more importantly, when we look at the function of cones and their uh, 
uh, amplitude of their response and their sensitivity, it was not affected. Even though we restored the RPE visual cycle, costs were still desensitized and they had uh, small amplitudes just like in our knockout. So there was no beneficial effect uh, from the RPE visual cycle. What about the retina visual cycle? So we did the, the opposite experiment where now are restoring expression of CRLBP only in the Miller cells, but not in the RPE cells. And again, you can see how uh, the Miller cells throughout the retina are expressing CRLBP. What will happen with the function of cons now? Boom. So now all of a sudden now we see both the restoration of dark adaptation in the isolated retina because we've rescued the, the Miller cell pathway, but more importantly we see a substantial increase in the sensitivity of cons and also their maximum response was, in, was increased. And so what this result clearly shows is that a functional Miller cell visual cycle actually is critical for the normal function and for the health of cone photoreceptors. And when we take this, this pathway specifically out, even if we still have the RP uh, pathway still there, cones become desensitized. And I'm not showing you this, but we also saw rescue, partial rescue at least, on the mislocalization of conopsin. And so what we think is happening essentially is that uh, chromophore coming from the Mueller cells feeds into the cell bodies of cone photoreceptors where conopsin is being expressed and folded. And by binding to this opsin, it helps to, to fold it properly and then helps to target it normally to the outer segment. And ultimately, uh, this provides a healthy and functional cone photoreceptors. And when the Mueller cells are no longer able to do that, when they lack, for instance, CRLBP, then conopsin becomes mislocalized because there is not enough chromophore coming in from the Mueller cells, and then cones eventually degenerate because of the lack of opsin. And so to summarize what I showed you again, uh, we find that this protein CRLBP plays a critical role in supporting cone function and survival. It is a key component not only of the RPE visual cycle, but also of the Mueller cell pathway. And specifically in the Mueller cells, again, it plays a role in providing sufficient chromophore to sustain the function of cones. And uh, this feeds again into this more broad hypothesis that chronic chromophore deprivation is actually really bad specifically for cones and not so much for rods. And if anybody's interested, I'm happy to talk to you afterwards. We are doing some experiments by switching rod and opsins, trying to really understand how the, the differences in the biophysical properties of the rod and cone opsins actually modulate this uh, higher susceptibility of cones to chromophore deficiency versus rods. And um, Again, I showed you that when we slow down the Mueller cell pathway by knocking out CRLBP, we get a substantial suppression of cone dark adaptation. Another way of saying the same thing is that the functional Mueller cell pathway actually is important for the rapid dark adaptation of cones. So where we are going with this is that we are trying to understand how uh, chromophore is trafficked between the Mueller cells and cone photoreceptors, what determines the specificity of this pathway only to cones and not to rods. And uh, finally, the last point that I want to touch upon is what are the kind of therapeutic or, or uh, functional implications as far as you as clinicians are concerned of the presence of two separate visual cycles. Um, and so uh, there are many uh, pharmacological pharmaceutical companies nowadays that are interested in developing drugs that target specifically the visual cycle. Uh, there are many mutations, for instance, in rhodopsin or in any of uh, several of the enzymes in the RPE visual cycle, both uh, in, 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 in the processing of chromophore in rods and in RPE cells that uh, slow down or, or the, the pathway and also lead to the accumulation of toxic byproducts, which eventually lead to retinitis pigmentosa, for instance. And so again, there are drug companies that are investing a lot of money trying to target this pathway and find a way to slow it down as a, as a, as a uh, for trying to slow down basically the accumulation of toxic byproducts. And so one uh, cautionary tale into this is that any, any drug that, that is targeted has to keep in mind what happens with cones. Because as I just showed you, uh, adequate supply of chromophore to cones actually is critical for their long-term survival. So you don't want to spite your face. Um, and cut your nose because uh, if, you, if you get a drug that works so well that it actually fully blocks the supply of chromophore to cause, uh, 
you might protect the rods, but you will end up losing the cost. And so this obviously will not be a useful drug. And so uh, I think if you're targeting a drug uh, to a reaction in the RPE visual cycle, that should work because you will still have the Mueller cell pathway. But if your drug is targeting a reaction that is common to both rods and cons, for instance, the reduction of retinol to retinol, then again, you will slow down the overall recycling of chromophore and that might have detrimental effects to the function of cons, even if the rods are protected in the process. Another um, interesting twist, um, and something that might be clinically relevant, is for instance what happens with retinal detachment. Right? So if you think about it, the retinal detachment is kind of like the experiments that I've been telling you about. You tear off the RP cells. And so um, when we started publishing this work, I, I got an email from a Dutch clinician who was really excited because he had this patient uh, who had a retinal detachment and he was able to measure scotopic and photopic vision in the uh, detached uh, area of the retina and what he found was that rod vision very rapidly declined but cone function persisted for, for days and days and days and one um, reasonable explanation for this that was, would be that of course when you get rid of the RP just as I showed you today uh, rods very quickly run out of chromophore and stop mediating vision but cones can still rely on their Mueller cell visual cycle and uh, get chromophore and recycle chromophore and sustain their vision. So again, I think that there are uh, potential clinical uh, implications and particularly, I think, um, pharmaceutical companies that, that uh, develop drugs targeting the visual cycle have to be absolutely sure that any drug that they test is not killing the cones in the process of rescuing uh, the RP pathway and the rods. So, so this is what I wanted to tell you today. Again, I hope kind of the, the message that you will take home from all of this is that in addition to the RPE uh, pathway, which everybody knows is critical for providing chromophore to both rods and cones, there is this other pathway which relies, resides in the Mueller cells, which is cone specific, and it helps to regenerate the pigment only in cones and not in rods. And this pathway has plays a critical role in providing chromophore to cones and helping to uh, express and target conopsin and in the long term sustain the, the function and survival of con photoreceptors. And so again, with this I'll stop and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you. So, uh, fabulous. Thank you. It was great work. It shows even though people say, hey, this is an old cycle, Exactly. Yeah. So uh, one that's come out of our laboratories here is out of Robert Mark and Brian Jones' lab about the fact that sure. for a long time clinicians <coughs> assumed that uh, uh, the retinal system was kind of like wiring your house. You know, right. The light bulb goes out. All you need is you screw the light bulb and everything will be fine. And, and their work has shown that, that you know you wipe out the rods and cones from any process you want any disease. Uh, and there's this extensive sure. wiring right. that occurs that essentially neural tissue, and there's evidence now the brain does this as well. If you're not getting normal stimulation, those cells want to be stimulated, so they'll, they'll work. What is your sense, uh, how, much pro how much do the Mueller cells play in this, this, this rewiring and this transformation to this very bizarre looking right. I'm sure you've seen some of this. What sure, sure, of course, I mean, yeah, yeah. Very bizarre looking. Any yeah. Mueller cells are very involved in that? Uh, I don't know, I would imagine. So I think one kind of emerging theme is that Mueller cells actually are much more important than previously appreciated for the function of specifically photoreceptors. Uh, I think now that there is new data coming from Jim Hurley's lab, for instance, that metabolism in photoreceptors is uh, closely tied to metabolism in Mueller cells, and the photoreceptors rely heavily on Mueller cells. Uh, I think it will be, so kind of the long-winded, that's a long-winded answer. The short answer is I don't really know how the Mueller cells are involved in rewiring. But one way we've been thinking about asking the question, this question in the context of the visual cycle is there are diseases where specifically the Mueller cells are affected. For instance, in, in, in response to stress, there is an upregulation of, of uh, genes in Mueller cells. They change their metabolism and it will be really interesting to see if some of those diseases, there is an effect either on re rewiring or in our case in the visual cycle and specifically on the function of cons. Uh, again, in some cases it might be beneficial. Again, this upregulation of gene expression in mule cells might, be, uh, might have a protective role. Uh, 
or it might be kind of the early uh, signals that, that drive the degeneration of fault receptors. So um, unfortunately, the mural cells are really important uh, for the um, function and maintaining the structure of the retina. So you can knock out, you know, you can kill rods, you can kill cones, you can kill uh, certain ganglion cell types. If you kill mural cells, the retina falls apart. So again, it's, it's really tricky to study the, the functional role of Mueller cells because, again, they are so important and the moment you take them out, the whole retina falls apart. So when we were doing, I didn't show those experiments, but the way we showed that the Mueller cells are critical for the function of, uh, for this dark rotation of cones is we would take a retina and incubate it for a brief period of time in a gliotoxin that basically kills selectively the Mueller cells. And if we did this for an hour or so in a mouse retina, we could show that the mule cells basically vanished, Most, some of them, not all of them. Uh, and then we could see that the recovery of cons was suppressed. But if you incubate it with the gliotoxin for three, four hours, basically the whole retina would fall apart and we would not get anything out of it. So uh, again, I think that's a great point. And, and, and uh, the bottom line is that mule cells are clearly, again, much more important than previously appreciated. And, um, Taking them out is probably not uh, altogether is not uh, feasible. But if you if you want to study a specific pathway, then uh, if you have a genetic way of altering this pathway selectively in mule cells, that will be very instructive. And so that's the direction in which we're going. We're hoping to learn more about the enzymes involved in recycling of chromophore in mule cells, and then target them and see how this affects the function of cons and the survival of fault receptors. Yeah. Yes. Uh, that was really nice work. Thank you. Yeah. And you feel that it's because of a lack of chromophore supply. Yeah. Um, I was wondering how that's different or similar to, you know, a vitamin A deficiency state. Right. Well, is that really true though? So 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 there are two issues. I think when you when you deprive of chromophore by vitamin A deprivation or by knocking out CRBP or any of the other uh, visuals RP visual cycloproteins, so the, the cells are no longer able to respond to light as efficiently because they just have less visual pigment. But the difference is that the rods don't die. So if you look, for instance, so the most dramatic, at least in mice, way of blo essentially fully blocking uh, chromophore supplies, knocking out a key um, pathway in the RPE cycle called RP65. And if you take that out this gene, basically there is no chromophore in the retina at all. But if you then take a mouse that is uh, one year old that never had any chromophore and then you in introduce chromophore back, the rods will resume their function just fine. But the cones will long be gone. So the cones die you know, weeks after birth in, in, in these animals, whereas the rods can persist for months and months and months. So again, we think that there is uh, some, some fundamental difference between the opsins in rods and cones, which again, uh, help rods to survive even without chromophore, but in cons, it seems like chromophore is really essential for, 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 for their uh, long-term survival. So what we're doing with, uh, again, I, I, don't, I don't have time to go into this, but I'm happy to talk to anybody if interested afterwards, is we basically made a, a, a mouse where we switched a conopsin with rhodopsin, and the thinking was that we take this unstable conopsin, which requires chromophore, and put the rhodops in which doesn't seem to care whether there is chromophore or not. And this seems to have beneficial effect and, and enables cons to survive even in the absence of chromophore. So that's the bottom line there. Yeah. So it gives me a follow-up question. Uh, as I remember in severe vitamin A deficiency, I'm talking about the level of vitamin A deficiency that potentially is lethal. Yeah. In histopathology, uh, there is broad loss of the, of the cones. Right. But I can't remember. Rods uh, I know the cones just disappear. This is this is where people essentially are losing vision. I, I right. had a patient as an intern that uh, actually died from severe wow. vitamin A deficiency wow. and had gone functionally blind, other than some, some right. night vision, which fits with this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. So that again, I I, uh, I remember that histopathology there was just broad wipeout, and but you know, and, and it just seemed to me like maybe it was. Well, that, that fits, yeah, that seems to fit again with, with what we see in our animal models, yeah. yeah. It's not Sorry. so much in the, I mean, I, in patients that I've had with, uh, with vitamin A deficiency, actually, there's still some specific delivery to the cones. There's something different because if you talk to Dr. Creel, I don't think he's here right now, 
the cone function is actually preserved pretty well on the kind of, at least in humans with vitamin A deficiency, it's the rods that are down. Right. He still sees, the cones aren't dead yet. Until so you get to the total point. crash where the whole body's yeah. falling apart. And then yeah, I mean, that's right. really they, bad. They, they they until they, this lady was blind. Yeah. If, he's doing a, if he's doing a full field ERG, then, then how much of his, his A wave is really, I mean, his B wave is really cone function, and how much of it, that is just the... Right. Just looking at the flicker and things. Anyway. Okay. So, uh -huh. another question. You yeah. talked a little bit about the isomerase in RP65. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. What, tell me what you think is the state of knowledge of what's going on in the Mueller cells. Is it right. this one? Is it something else? Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, that's, a, that's a, I think, still an active area of research. So, so, what Paul is asking about is what is the enzyme that converts all trans retinol into 11 cis retinol? So, Gabe Travis's group at UCLA published a paper a few years ago suggesting that an isomerase called DES1-1 <coughs> is the one responsible for this reaction. We don't know yet, so uh, the only way you can, uh, I guess the most straightforward way you test this is by just knocking it out and asking wh whether this will affect this pathway or not. And they have been uh, suspiciously quiet for two, three years. I know they've been I working agree. on that, and, and every time I see Gabe, I said, hey, you know, what's going on? When is this mouse coming out? And uh, we haven't seen any results. So this is why we actually went for the CRLBP, because we were waiting for some, somebody else to knock out a key enzyme from this pathway, and it, it still has. So I, I don't know, again, uh, I'm not, uh, you know, I don't have a stake in this fight. Uh, there are people that believe it is, there are people that believe it is not. Uh, ultimately, again, somebody has to do, just do the experiment and find so, out. So, I mean, one of the problems with DES-1 is it's a very non-specific isomerase. It just, it, equilibrates, which it's not very efficient making 11 cis. Well, RP65, <coughs> that's what it Sure, does. sure. So when you knock out CRALBP oh, that's your great. Yeah. cells, do you see lots of different isomers? That's a, that's a great, very, very insightful question. So uh, we've actually been looking into that. So, uh, and our thinking was exactly this, is that this one, so this isomerase in, in uh, Mueller cells, um, seems to make more nicest retinol than 11 cis retinol, whereas the isomerase in the RP cells makes exclusively 11 cis. And so we thought maybe some of the chromophore coming from the Mueller cells would be 9 cis. Um, and we should be able, because 9 cis can bind to opsin and form a visual pigment, but it will be blue shifted. It, ha it will have different spectral absorption properties compared to 11 cis pigment. And so we, by measuring the spectral sensitivity of cones, we, should be, we thought we should be able to discriminate between 9 cis and 11 cis pigment in cones and see which one is coming back from the mule cells. And so we've done this both in, in amphibians and in mice, and we see no evidence for 9 cis retinol, which, which was kind of uh, bothersome. But then we actually looked at the CRLBP knockout mice, and um, one feature of CRLBP is that it binds specifically to 11 cis and not so much to 9 cis. So one possibility is that CRLBP actually favors, by binding to 11 cis, favors the production of 11 cis over 9 cis. And indeed, when we looked at uh, mice that lacked CRLBP, we saw evidence for about 50% 9 cis retinol in, in those cones. So we think that, again, the DES1 is still a viable candidate because if you take out CRLBP, you seem to get a lot of 9 cis in the comfort receptor. So, but that's, that's a very insightful question. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much.